and Professor Jeeva Gopal, Secretary, and Professor V S Prasad, and Mrs. Ramreddy, and other family members, and Professor Radha Krishna, the Chairman of uh, uh, SES Hyderabad, faculty and uh, staff of SES Hyderabad, distinguished guests, and uh, other members. It's truly a very humbling experience uh, to stand before with erudite scholars of contemporary India and to accept this award and to speak in the floor in the presence of all of you. I would like to underline the words that is used in citation that is the hope that I will continue the work in social science and public policy and uh, I'm sure that is a, a big challenge and I feel as though I am standing on the ocean of knowledge which is created by these scholars themselves and as an invitation to jump into this ocean and to swim for myself. I consider awards received in this age and young scientist awards as truly challenging invitations to accept a baton in a marathon <coughs> rally race and to, with a command, run faster. These are not trophies. Trophy is still awaited. But these are invitations uh, to which uh, you are asked to perform. And this performance is a challenging task to use Richard Rorty's term the challenge of holding the mirror to the society. In today's lecture, as I speak on, I have two central messages that I want to convey. The first message is, we need to redefine the area where Professor Ramrady has worked of the policy as a political responsibility. Since I moved to Bangalore three years back, I have the opportunity to work on this master's, Master of Public Policy program, as Professor Hargobal mentioned, along with many academic stalwarts, uh, citation, and they have put me as the architects. Uh, I would say it's a very collective work, and I am only one of the instruments there. And uh, a big team of uh, including Professor Hargobal, Professor Babu Matthew, Professor Parishram of Tata Institute of Social Sciences, uh, Professor Narsim Reddy City here, Professor Jafet, uh, Professor Abdul Aziz. A big team has been part of this and I have been kind of a trustee for this big team and then trying to carry out the mandate the big team has given to me. So I will, as I talk on this concept and message of how to redefine public policy as a social responsibility, I will be often slipping to this experience that we are doing in National Law School. It's an experiment of its own, which is facing a lot of challenges as well as very interesting experiences. A second message uh, that I will be talking is, when we define public policy as political responsibility, there are two aspects to it. First one is, to define public policy as learning what is the right thing to do. At the same time, that has got a second dimension, that is to know what is the wrong thing to do and how to avoid that wrong. So in the second aspect, I will be emphasizing that aspect of how often we fail to avoid that wrong or in our own conception of what is right, we fail to understand that and we make a mistake of making the poor people as victims of shame in delivering anti-poverty policies. So these are the two messages that I will be uh, largely focusing in my uh, lecture today. With this brief introductory remarks, let me begin. When I teach the introductory course to public policy, I often begin with a case. The case is simple. 
I ask the students, what is the age of marriage or what is the legal age of marriage in India? And often that is a question which is kind of a general knowledge question. So people fresh from a test, a typical entrance test, memories are very fresh. They say that yes, 21 years for boy and 18 years for girls. Very good, 100 marks. Then I ask next question. Has it been like that all the time? Then people began to scratch, thinking about their, digging their memories, and people come with different years when it has been so, when it has not been so. And then eventually someone Googles on the computer and finds out that yes, in 1972, uh, the, the year was 18 and 21 was made as legal marriage age. Then I ask the question, what happened before 1978? Then there is history of delay <coughs> during colonial time, what was the age? In 1929, there is a, a, a abolition of Child Marriage Act. Then I begin to ask students or I ask students to reflect on why all these changes? What happened? There is different explanations coming from different types of students and then I analyze these explanations. If I, when I, whenever I have analyzed these explanations in different batches I have taught, I have largely seen two types of explanations. A group of students explain the whole problem in technical manner. They say that, yeah, marriage age has to be raised because something happened to human body, something happened in society and therefore marriage age has to be raised. Interesting answer. And then I put another challenge. Has it ever happened that marriage age went back? That is, it was 18. And then it, was it reduced to 17? If it went back, then there is something with that problem of the technical language, isn't it? Technical logic is not working. And then you have cases to show that marriage age has gone back. And you can complicate this case if you add Muslim personal laws, legitimate marriages, but then why different age? And you also can take, compare Indian marriage age with Western countries' marriage ages, where Christian laws permit you to marriage at 15, and some countries have accepted. So, are they more progressive, less progressive than India? So, you complicate the issue and then you beat your technical rationality. Somebody will immediately say that, see, India is a very complicated country. There are lots of push and pulls on political sides and therefore because of the ideology differences you keep changing. That is one group which comes with a rationality. And then I ask, okay, let us take a different context. Let us look at child labor laws. You think British politics is not that kind of arm and debate, isn't it? It doesn't move back and forth like Indian politics. So let us take child labor law. And think when child labor was made, when child labor was abolished, and then what happened to that? So when we go back to history, we see that yes, child labor was abolished after Robert Owen really pushed in 1819 that uh, beyond the age of nine, uh, you had to be age of nine to enter into factory. But after 30 years, you have it pushed back to age of eight. Then what happened? So technical rationality is not even working there. There is another group of students who keeps talk, talk, talking about the second group. As I said, there are two broad groups. One group which talks about technical rationality, technical reasons why something has to be fixed in a particular way. Another group which talks about, yeah, you have a vision about society. You want to get there and you think this is how it should be. And you fix certain ideas as the goal points and you have to hit that goal. And I, I saw them as political responses.
towards which we are moving and we are taking forward. Technical rationality takes a second or back stage. These two types are what I call as the mechanical causation and final causation. And I'll be primarily arguing when I redefine public policy as political responsibility for the political causation or uh, uh, how our po politics has to come to the center stage of public policy. This approach of thinking about problems or disturbing our mind when we see problems is the public policy approach. To ask questions like why traffic in Bangalore is so messy or why this river is so polluted or why farmers are committing suicide. To ask these questions and then to begin to find answers. Answers in the sense of not understanding but to create new institutional arrangements to change it. That's what all public policy is doing. There's no magic there. It's all about asking disturbing questions and not merely understanding but finding new institutional arrangements. That is what was emphasized by Harold Laswell, who was the father, considered to be father of public policy, though there are many other scholars before that, uh, who wrote a very famous uh, uh, paper called Policy Orientations in 1951, radically changing the whole course of pol political science discipline and making it relevant for uh, real world in terms of moving into a problem orientation. Now, once we have this issue of problem orientation, that is, we have we are searching for what is the right thing to do for this particular problem. We could justifiably adopt a technical rationality, as some of my students did, and I would classify them as administrative view of public policy. I'm not sure if the lecture that is here will be circulated later. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, it's circulated. Oh, it's circulated. In an appendix, you will see one of the appendix. You will see a, a language of policy that is classifying using two words. That is, what are the words standing for politics and policy? We often think that there is a equivalent word for policy in all the languages. And I was surprised when I learned that a good number of languages doesn't have a separate word for policy. Both words for policy and politics are same in a lot of languages. I am not a linguist and then of course analyzing that will get us into completely different trajectory. For example, in Telugu, uh, policy translation policy stands for uh, Vidhanam. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we can keep thinking about what is Vidhanam. And I checked in Kannada, Bangalore, where I come from, though that's not my mother tongue. I checked uh, what is that, and that stands for Niti. That is something which comes from Indo Aryan language uh, tradition. But a Kannada legislative assembly is called Vidhan Sauda. And I asked someone immediately, what is Vidhan Sauda? That person doesn't know what is Vidhan Sauda. It is often called legislative assembly. Uh, but uh, this kind of a how in different languages policy and politics is used is very interesting analysis somebody should take. And uh, why I am talking about this to show the centrality of the politics there. In most of the European languages, both politics and uh, po policy has got just one word, politica. <laughs> so when I was doing social policy, uh, a German scholar will come and say that, yeah, okay, you are doing social politic. Basically means social politics. There's no separate word for policy. means just one. The accusation on Anglo-Saxon languages this whole separation of policy and politics is way of depoliticizing the political voices of public problems. We're taking away the politics from there and using the technical rationality to solve the problem because politics is problematic, ideologically divided. So cut it off and take out the take the heart out and solve the other things, fix it. And if you want, put you can put the heart back. That's what when you separate <coughs> policy and politics, it does. So redefining public policy as political responsibility needs to do the trick of keeping the heart there and still trying to solve them, still trying to do the operation there. So it's a very difficult task, at the same time very important task.
task. If we keep looking for a mechanical causation, what is happening is we are always looking for a definitive problem. But interestingly, all the problems thrown to the public policy professionals are wicked problems. There is no definitive problem thrown to you. The question such as why traffic is so bad has got its own problems when you solve as well. So therefore you can't actually solve the problem as a definitive problem. If the problem is defined as a definitive problem, well designed problem, then the solutions are easy. You can have a technical formula to solve the problem. But technical problem uh, formula is not easily perceivable because the problem itself is a wicked problem. And therefore, we need to surprise the people by creating the problem in a new way, by creating the problem. So therefore, problem finding itself takes the whole lot of time of a policy scholar rather than problem solving. Technical rationality will help us only to solve, not to find. In finding, we have to use our creativity by keeping the politics at the heart and then find the problem and then begin to solve it and there our technical rationality may be <coughs> helpful. If we define the problem definitively and in mechanistically, then uh, social science is very comfortable with public policy. If we refuse to define it mechanistically, we want to define for the goals, the values, where society should be moving, then social science is in friction with public policy. That is where the tension begins between social science as a discipline and public policy as a discipline. I like to, from the paper, I like to read uh, the uh, quotation by Friedman. Uh, which summarizes this tension. Let me call it Friedman. In the so-called disciplines, discourse is of course mostly about theory. And sociologists, anthropologists, geographers, psychologists, and all other is risk being ostracized from their respective clans should they be bold enough to seriously venture into policy applications. Social scientists live for theory. This is what Friedman does. As long as you create theory, you are a good social scientist. The moment you begin to apply, you are not worth. The kind of literature we just tried to understand, what are the practical difficulties in translating good social science theory into applying, has, there is quite a lot of literature on this, and they have said that, the whole problem is with the way knowledge is structured, how knowledge is transmitted through university system. And universities became very popular in the 19th century and that was the time when positivist science was at its height. And therefore can positivist science take forward the knowledge question in a meaningful manner to solve the real world problems. That's what I ask a question to public policy students. Can we discipline our minds? when we answer wicked problems or when we address wicked problems. Yes, I am comfortable with the sociologist theory, I am comfortable with the economist theory, I can discipline my mind to look at the wicked problem, cut the problem to the size that I want and to study what I want to advance economic theory. Can I do same kind of discipline when I, a wicked problem is thrown to me? That's a epistemological question that a policy student has to ask oneself and uh, answer for himself. There's a beautiful uh, bit of a satirical quotation from Rothman which uh, uh, I like to read. I love reading that quotation. It's like an imagery of social science going, social scientists going to a forest. The social science researchers have gone into forest of knowledge, felt a good and sturdy tree and displayed the fruits of their good work to each other. That is, discipline is talking to each other. Few enterprising application-minded guys dragged some logs to the river and showed them off the downstream. They call it diffusion. Somewhere down the river, the practitioners are manning the construction company.
fields with what they can find that have drifted down the stream. But on the whole, they are sorely lacking the timber in various sizes and forms they need to do their work properly. The problem is that someone has forgotten to build the mill to turn the logs into usable forms. The logs continue to pile up on the one end. Theories, lots of theories. On the other side, construction companies continue to make their dues on the other end. In the master public policy program, we are trying to build this mill. <laughs> lots of theories, you don't need much more new theories and knowledge. There is, but we have to cut them into pieces and then make it usable in a, for the administrators. People who are translating the policies made with good intention to good programs. So that is the challenge that we are engaged with as a team in creating this whole uh, master public policy program. So what I was talking is how we need to move beyond this mechanistic causation. And I was telling if we define a bigger problem in a as a definitive problem in a mechanistic causation way, then social science is comfortable. But then social science become uncomfortable when bigger problems fail to fit into their scheme of things. That's what I was telling. Now we need to think about ways as to okay, what is the knowledge system then to move beyond mechanistic causation? How do we find ways of doing it. That's what we were all worried and thinking when we were actually designing this public policy program. So we thought about many, many alternatives. First alternative, what we ruled is, yes, of course, we don't want these students who are coming out of this course to tell or to reflect themselves and say that, yeah, I am a theoretical physician, but I plead not to apply my theory into or experiment my theory and spoil my beautiful theory. We don't want the kind of a theoretical people to come out. We want people who are bold people. We want people who are really able to experiment with the world and to say that, yes, this is something which I created. Now experiment and see where it works. I stand by where it fails. I'm ready to stand by and still correct it. That's the kind of people that we want. So we thought about what can we teach? If you teach pure economics, yes, you will create theoretical physicians. And if you treat, uh, if you uh, if you teach just law, which law school has been doing for 25 years, what will happen? So uh, if we think in terms of the applications of just economists, as my own mentor in Oxford, Barbara Harris, talks about, uh, yes, economics comes with prescriptive consequentialism. That is, economists says that this ought to be done. Beyond that, there is no other way. Con uh, a prescriptive consequentialism. That's not what our students are. We don't want our students to do an economic analysis on the problem and to become consequentialist pres prescriptionists. Law, a lot of public policy questions have gone to court of law. And courts have thrown, thrown up their hands. We can't solve them. Great examples. For example, the question on should water be supplied by municipalities to slum dwellers? Indian courts have, through PALs, have debated this question again and again. And there is no solution. Much better than Indian courts, uh, South African constitution has done marvelous work. They had exactly the same problem. Should drinking water be supplied to the slums in uh, Johannesburg? And one court said that, yes, 50 liters of water to every household should be supplied. Some other court said, no, it should be 55. And finally, constitutional court said that court has no capacity to decide whether it should be 50, 55, 60. As long as state takes an action, court will not interfere. When state stops to take an action, court will interfere and say that they should do something about it. That's all what law can say. So, we agreed, yes, economics is important, law is important, but that alone will not solve the wicked problems that are faced by the people. Then what should, what will solve? What will happen? That was the challenge that we were facing. And we realized that we need to look back to the schema of knowledge itself if we have to look at what will be useful. 
So when we looked at scheme of knowledge, we found, yes, two dominant scheme of knowledge exist. From beginning with Socrates and Plato, you have the famous scheme of episteme techne, that is your theory driven, you have techne driven, application driven, and both of them are applied and used in many of the knowledge contexts, but do both these solve the problems of addressing weaker problems? And we found, no, it is not solving. So what else will solve? A strong view that came is what we need to do with the students is we need to sensitize them. We need to give them a value orientation. We need to give them a strength to get convinced about their own views. And the students which are, who were coming, they were looking for a value frame. They were looking for meaning. And we were convinced about that. And we found that just within the four walls of university, you cannot do it. You have to get them exposed to the world outside these four walls. So one important component that we built into the program was a component of field work and working with organizations which are already working in the field of public policy, government departments, <coughs> organizations which are translating. This was what was envisaged and planned and being implemented. However, these are not without challenges. These are extremely problematic. In the first year, we sent the students to work for one month in Rajasthan and uh, with Aruna Roy and team, they worked in the field work, came back with a lot of energy, enthusiasm, with new value convictions. In the second year, we sent them to all different types of places, including some of the remote areas. And I'd like to share one of the very unfortunate incidents this time. <coughs> we one of our students who went to the Yamgiri Hills to work in Orissa, very malaria-prone area. He contracted cerebral malaria, came back to the university, fought with malaria, and died uh, two weeks back. A shock from which uh, we are still uh, recovering. And these are extreme challenges of creating value system for us. Exposing ourselves to problems. And when all of us were shocked after this event, we sat with the students, public policy students, <coughs> the next day in a condolence meeting. And we were worried as to how we can take forward this program. And we put forward the challenge to the students themselves. We asked the question, should public policy professionals who are getting trained for getting exposed to value system be sent to remote areas and be exposed to risks like this. And we were shocked to hear their responses. Some of the students stood up and said, we have made a choice in this life. That is to solve the problems of this country. And we need to be exposed. We need to be sent to much more interior areas. And I found just one day after their classmates dead, this kind of a response coming from young generation of this country, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of passion that is coming. And uh, I have, uh, along in consideration with my colleagues in the university, have requested cash produce proceedings from this award to go to create a gold medal in memory of the student who has died, uh, which I hope the university will take forward. Uh, uh, to applaud the, the courage that the students of Master of Public Policy have uh, shown. I kept thinking about a very old classic work of Ruskin, titled Unto This Last, which has influenced Gandhi's work, where he talks about when should one person die. And he says that that decision should be in your hand. He gives examples of different professions. A soldier knows he should die in the battleground than running away from the field. Doctor knows he should die in order to save a life. Priest knows he should die for not teaching falsehood. And I add to Ruskin, say that a public policy professional dies by speaking truth to power. 
use the terms of analysis as craft and analysis craft, art and craft. In the sense of the courage to die and as, ex ex as exemplified by one of the students, I consider myself this program has already had the baptism by blood and it is going to thrive and it is going to change the course of India by taking the course of public problems to the real world. Some of them may not die. But some of them will imbibe a new value spirit and will change and challenge the policy makers. <coughs> we have examples from India. For example, Ken Raj. I remember reading uh, uh, his uh, review of his work in one of the magazines. And uh, when a young, young economist did PhD and came back to India and asked by Nehru to uh, draft the uh, part of the five year plans, and when the growth uh, forecast was so low, Nehru called him and said, better than Nehru, when this small guy, who is not even 30s, asked him, why is growth rate is so low? And Ken Raj confidently answered. He asked a question to Nehru. The quotation is, if you have to choose between democracy and fast rate of development, what will you choose, sir? That is the conviction value system Ken Raj brought to take forward the truth to the power. And the public policy question is exactly that. Can I speak truth to the power once I have imbibed their value system and I want to take forward this to the change that I want? Now, yes, this movement of epistemology as well as finding a new way of dealing with the policy makers or the power is extremely difficult. We can understand how hard it is only by seeing the context of policy. And typically in the public policy literature, the context is defined as three things, ideas, institutions and actors. And if we review this, all these three contexts of policy in India, we find that we don't have a real good policy context. As Ramchandra Guha tells, India as a country is ideologically divided. And if a country is ideologically divided, where will you find a neutral discourse or a space for debating reasons? So you have a very poor context of ideology or where ideas are not mature enough for meaningful, healthy interactions. If you look at the institutions, we have very weak institutions where almost individuals overshadow the institutions. And if the institutional context is so poor, how do institutions survive? As in the remarks, Professor Hargobal said, in systems fail to incorporate good individuals, but the institutions are actually captured by poor quality individuals. How will institutional capacity improve if the institutions are manned in this manner? Similarly, third policy context actors that also show a poor quality because you have collusion of actors and not independent actors. And therefore, the neutral decision making or suggestion for decision making becomes hugely important apart from the collusions. So you have a very poor quality of the uh, policy context, a point to which I'll come back when I get to the next uh, phase of the paper that is uh, the dignity aspect of uh, policy implications. Now I will summarize this section by restating what I mean by public policy as political responsibility. So what we have seen so far is we have seen the ineffectiveness of mechanical rationality to deal with the wicked problems and how wicked problems have to be redefined in a problem finding manner by using the value system that is in consonance with the reality. Then we, are, we have created alternatives of what solution should be coming because we have created a uh, uh, we have created a solutions for the problem that is thrown to us. 
and then we are moving to adopt a particular alternative while changing the course of the action for the problem. That's where we are at. But when we enter the policy table, policy making table or even suggesting a policy, we always are manned with an alternative that emanates from my value system as a policy analyst, including the rigor that I may have bought from a particular discipline or a particular analysis. But your views, your values, your uh, analysis that you are bringing may not have takers there. That has to be compromised with what other stakeholders, other actors bring to the table. At that point of time, the ability to persuade, the ability to dialogue with others who come with a different view is a very critical aspect for incorporating the political dimensions of public policy. If we stick to the rigor of analysis that I brought, if we stick to the rigor of values that I brought, I am not fail I am failing to deal with public policy as a <coughs> political responsibility. The moment I say that, yes, I need to get beyond what I have believed, that is my atomistic view of understanding the problem, by compromising, by persuading, by arguing with others, then I am taking the responsibility of moving away from uh, 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 the uh, mechanistic causation to uh, uh, political causation. This was beautifully summarized as an advice from our former uh, uh, RBI governor, Y.V. Reddy, uh, when he gave this uh, very interesting uh, uh, insight about how economists should see their own views. So he talks about, he distinguishes between two kinds of things. He talks about economic ideas as well as ideas of economists. And he said they have to be treated differently. And he says that yes, an economist needs to do his robust analysis on the problem in economic way. And still, when he advises a policy advisor, he has to take a role of a successful politician, able to persuade others to adopt the policies that he or she has judged to be appropriate. He's talking about persuasion. So this aspect of persuasion, the ability to enter into persuasion rather than taking a backseat or becoming passive to our own suggestions or our own convictions is what I call as forsaking of political responsibility. Often when I look at the academic papers and books, always at the end I see a, a few, few paragraphs, policy implications, and I don't see a passion. I don't feel the person has engaged with the policy issue seriously. Yeah, this has implications from whatever you have written, I can understand. But then you are not persuading me to believe that or to move me to think in the direction. So uh, I always find that kind of paragraph, few paragraph, is not strong enough to be qualifying the mass policy analysis. It has to be much more persuasive, built from the very beginning of defining the problem as to what kind of a problem and what kind of solutions are persuaded for in the writing. I hope I have made, made very clear as to what I mean by uh, political responsibility. If not, what I am repeating is, yes, there should be a value orientation in defining the problem and this value orientation should be held very close until not only through the problem defining and defining alternatives and making a decision as to which alternative is to push, even after that, to persuade with others and to sit with others and talk uh, on uh, with others who may be holding different values as the political responsibility. Now I get into second uh, part of uh, this lecture where I am looking at the uh, how in the whole domain of public policy human dignity can be brought in. The very reason why I am talking about this aspect is because of the centrality of the topic. Because some people think that why? Why dignity? We have so many other issues. Uh, so in the first part of the second section of the paper, that's what I have written about centrality of the question of moral worthiness. Uh, to quote uh, 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 two scholars, rather than arguing about it uh, extensively because of the time constraints. First, John Rawls in his uh, 
theory of justice talks about self respect honor as the most important from a different school egalitarian school amartya sen talks about while arguing why poverty is not relative he talks about shame as the irreducible absolutist core of in the idea of poverty shame as the irreducible absolutist core in the idea of poverty he goes back to adam smith and says that yeah a person should be comfortable to move around in whatever dress that he wears whatever views that he holds without being condemned by other society that has the test that has the litmus proof to say that whether there is poverty or not those are quite sufficient to say that why this is so important for us to discuss as to whether public policy should enable an environment of that kind to avoid shame dishonor and to bring more dignity so uh, as is uh, 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 as uh, uh, professor vir sad has pointed out uh, many of my recent research is on this aspect of uh, how to avoid occurrences of shame uh, in the context of anti poverty policies being delivered and uh, i am um, about to undertake a very huge uh, uh, study of uh, con uh, controlled trial uh, randomized controlled trial by uh, testing the uh, capacity of a training program among the mid day meal scheme uh, in karnataka um i will only talk about three aspects through which the shaming occurs when anti poverty policies are being delivered and yeah, there are many more uh, but uh, uh, for for the purpose of this lecture i will limit to these three and uh, 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 i will end uh, with those three aspects first important aspect is in the whole process of anti poverty program something called othering happens we are always creating policies for other these other is unskilled labor rural poor uh, single women household all of them are others and we are creating policies for the other and other is not treated the way i may be treating myself my own self respect my own family other is treated as the other so impersonalized policies are created and those are impersonalized and they are other because they are failures they are failures they have failed to come out in life they have failed to come to city rural poor they have no skills unskilled so they are failure their moral worth is questioned and some program has to be created to bring them up so that approach is hugely problematic uh, when we talk about the uh, when we talk about the uh, whole aspect of uh, dignity into social uh, programs particularly anti poverty programs i can quote uh, professor vm rao who passed away uh, earlier this year uh, where he talks about policy making for rural development he has a beautiful sentence the policy maker treats i am quoting him the policy maker treats the rural poor in exactly the same way we individuals treat the beggar we do not ask the beggar how he was reduced to his present state of what he will do tomorrow we indulge in a bit of charity by giving arms to the beggar without any intention to help him acquire better status This is how the employment programs and PDS work. The policy maker proudly announces the amount spent and the poor who benefited. But there are no arrangements at all to ensure food security and employment security to the poor. What's the name? This statement by a veteran policy advisor and academic only shows that just the distribution is not enough. To use the term of Nancy Fraser and uh, Honet. we need to have recognition along with distribution while talking about uh, recognition uh, of the subjects they have a very interesting uh, scheme coming from uh, hegel in his uh, system of ethical living he talks about three types of recognition that we enjoy in our lives first one is in our family in our family in our extended family joint family we enjoy the love from our family members nobody is going to hurt you they all love us and we live in a perfect safety i get out of my house and run to the lane depending on where you live we move 
into the city and I see the faces of strangers who doesn't recognize my face. But surety I have that those strangers are not going to slap me. What prompts me to step into amid strangers? And Hegel says that it is because you have a system of laws that is created. As long as I don't slap, that person will not slap. A system of social contractory laws are created and you are comfortable. None of us think about not getting to a, a, a strangers, thinking that they are going to slap. We are not afraid. That is second state of uh, uh, recognition. First love, second laws give us protection to behave, act the way we want. A third stage, which Hegel and uh, uh, Honneth talks about, uh, interpreting Hegel, is about the stage of solidarity. That is, this concept of law, that is, I am respecting you, you are respecting me, becomes imbibed, it goes beyond law, and becomes intuitively part of my attitude to other, and I stand for the other, and the solidarity begins to happen. You don't need laws there. You are back to the question of love, almost like a family, that is, you live in an environment which is comfortable where laws have been interiorized. Can policy making get to that level of interiorization of self-respect for each other? Policy makers, policy advisors, respect for people who are not seen as failures and lacking moral work, but rather people who are just like us people who are equal moral birth as I am. A second point regarding the discomfort of lack of dignities in the uh, anti-poverty policies is the distinction between policy making and policy implementation. As we keep a very strong, tight, watertight compartment kind of arrangement between policy making and policy implementation. And in Indian context, this takes place the shape of large number of schemes and packages. Actually, in the forest, in the forest of schemes and packages, you don't feel the policy. You can't see the policy. Where is policy? And schemes and packages don't reveal any goals where society is moving. You just see schemes and policies. And I often think that what is happening with this kind of a too much of schemization or too many schemes is we have a kind of a illusory expectation. <coughs> that is, if we want, if I want to uh, paint this whole uh, uh, room, uh, I take a, a basket of uh, paint, start throwing one scheme here, one scheme there, one scheme here, and think that one day all this will be painted. So, with universal health coverage policy, that is our goal. We have one scheme for this, one Amnapurna, one this. What are we doing? We are hoping one day everything will be painted. An illusory hope. And the whole process of schemes and packages, what happens is a perpetuation of the patronage politics. So you can see, uh, the moment you go to poor houses, you can see uh, Rajiv Gandhi, Awas Yojana, or some other place, Adal Bihari pension scheme. Of course, they are signals to vote because they have given something. At the same time, on my house, there is not Adal Bihari or Rajiv Gandhi. Those houses are built because of my merit, isn't it? Their houses are built not because of their merit, but because of somebody else's merit. And that's the meritocracy that appreciates and shames the poor people by putting packages of patronages on uh, different types of uh, anti poverty programs. A third important uh, dimension where human dignity is missing is passing on the social response, passing on the response, public responsibility to social institutions. Many of you would have seen the uh, boardings these days, uh, Modi's picture and asking, give up your subsidy. Whenever you see this, yeah, I didn't give up. Am I really worth living in this country? It is shaming <laughs> by controlling you through social control by cancer. What they are doing is they are actually shifting the responsibility. I can't do this, but do it. If you don't do it, you are subject to shame. Another 
very unquestioned dimension of public policy which is happening is dealing with uh, information asymmetry in targeted programs. List of welfare beneficiaries are created, they are, by as a mandatory, they are to be posted on Pajayat offices. I have tried to argue with many people this is inhumane. Please stop doing it. And I have always been hit. See, you have some Western idea. You don't think about what it in reality is. People are cheating here. Poor people are cheats. Do you know? <laughs> we have to really check it. We need transparency. It is almost like an uh, questionable practice today. In the name of transparency, you have to put the name. When I ask questions back, okay, so why are we not putting non taxpayers list somewhere? You're hit back. You do it. That's not my duty. You do it. Uh, there is no uh, PowerPoint here, but I actually want to show a very nice picture, very disturbing picture from the district of Kandua in Madhya Pradesh. Where, in order to avoid poor people taking the housing schemes, a trick they used, they went to the houses and they uh, wrote, painted big paintings on the house, Mem Garib Hum. Big painting. And so many pictures in which four people standing in front of the picture with their name and Mem Garib Hum. And one of the uh, persons said, uh, he's saying, I am quoting, Yes, we are poor, but should the government try to address our poverty or mock us by branding us poor in this humiliating manner? So it is not just me or some uh, elites who are talking. People are saying, please don't shame us. If you don't want to give, don't give. But don't brand us. Don't shame us. But it is uh, it is a uh, big uh, uh, big uh, uh, a, uh, a program on which there is a lot of agreement that in the name of transparency we have to uh, do this. This is something which, as I said in the beginning, will come back. That is, uh, yes, a public policy is searching for what is the right thing to do. Yes, that's, a, that's what we are doing. We have to ask what is the right thing to do and advise governments as to what is the right thing to do. But at the same time, a second part of that question is what is the wrong thing to do? And how to avoid doing wrong things? That is also a public policy question. Just like in this case, yeah, right thing to do, do a correct targeting of the welfare programs, and the poverty programs. But am I justified to do this kind of a wrongly targeting? Or sorry, sorry to use that uh, wrongly uh, in a dignified, undignified manner, uh, avoiding people to uh, take your benefits. That is something which uh, uh, a public policy should inform. Though these questions are big, challenges are difficult. We all go back to the question of political, uh, the policy context, ideas, actors, and institution. Does it allow us? And often with this kind of a experience of delivering anti-poverty programs or other public policy programs in undignified manner. The feeling is because of the poor policy context, we actually are experiencing lack of public. The public actually has not emerged. There is a space for debating, a space for individual citizens to experience a free life actually has not emerged. Rather, we may be actually dealing with policy advices in feudal contexts. That is the way poor people have to be treated in this manner. It may be feudal context in which we may be giving policy advice. Which makes the challenge of public policy profession much more difficult. That is, how do we communicate truth to the power in a meaningful manner? And that becomes much more difficult when we have a feudal system of governing. I will stop with these words. Thank you.